My name is Gerda Föricht Fiegel. I'm the director of the European Studies Program at our institution and the presenter of this online event. I'm at, your, at our media center from where we, I welcome all our guests who are connected online. The topic of today's event is Austria in the European Union, 25 plus one, review and preview. Today's event hosts two interview partners who focus on the review and the keynote speaker who invites us to look at future trends. We also look forward to a vivid discussion with you and invite you to share your thoughts on each input. And some prizes are waiting for you in our online quiz. Our online event is scheduled to wrap up about 5 p.m. We will record the online event. You can watch it on Tuesday, 18th of May, on the YouTube channel of our university. So let's start right in with review. I'm very glad that Heinz Zurek is with us today. In 1995, he was one of the first Austrian general directors in the European Commission. In addition to him, I welcome Nicole Semliak, a young alumna of our university, born in 1995, the year in which Austria became a member of the European Union. After our review, Anna Heenberger, expert in economy at the Momentum Institute Austria, is going to look at future trends of the European Union. This is an interactive online conference, and we invite all of you to participate in the discussion via the chat. So please enter your comments in the chat function. My co-presenter, Sarah Reimbrecht, is going to manage your comments and questions and will pass them over to me. Before we start with our interview partners and the review, I'm very glad that the managing director of the University of Applied Sciences, Burgenland, Georg Pehm, and the head of Department of Business Studies and Vice Rector for Research and Innovation, Silvia Ettelhuber, are with us. And I'd like to turn the floor over to them. Ladies and gentlemen, dear professors, dear guests, dear students, welcome to this conference. We have been organizing the European Business Forum Burgenland for years. As you know, this is the Europe Day, a celebration day for millions and millions of people. And for us, of course, a big tradition, meanwhile. Last year, we had to come together in September. This year, we are very close to the Europe Day date. But again, and for a well-known reason, not close to each other. That's a pity, of course, in every respect. And it's a pity in particular for a university that is one of the most personal universities of all. But what is unchanged? Firstly, what has remained the same is that we see ourselves as an international institution not only because students from more than 70 different countries study here, not only because we are in a geographical position with short distances to so many neighbors countries, seeing ourselves as an international institution has been anchored in our DNA since the beginning. Secondly, it comes from this attitude that we see ourselves as Europeans. We are convinced that the future of this continent does not lie in nation states acting as selfishly as possible, but in supranational close cooperation. The future needs the European Union, and the European Union is the future. That is why we have been celebrating the European Business Forum Burgenland for 24 years. That is why we strive for international contacts and partners. That is why international topics are of great importance in teaching. And that is because we've got the unshakable experience, in particular here in Burgenland, 
that being a part of the European Union has brought new educational opportunities, new economic opportunities, new jobs, additional wealth, and despite times of a pandemic, open borders without travel restrictions. As the Regionalmanagement Burgenland, by the way, a very important and welcome partner in organizing this conference has emphasized more than once the evidence that Eastern part of Austria has been a really lucky winner of the integration process since 1995. We are winners is the shortest possible conclusion from a review. Looking back is important, of course, because only those who know where they have come from also know where they have to go. In my view, this path, the look into the future, can only lie in more Europe, not less, in more democracy, not less, in more cooperation, not less, and in more integration, not less. A look into the future brings us to the conviction that national pettiness is over, and only a common policy for this continent must be the orientation for the future. This conference, ladies and gentlemen, is another opportunity to take a stand in this sense and to contribute actively to the development of our European Union and the whole European continent. Above all, I would like to thank the Department of International Management, Vice Rector and Director of the Department, Professor Dr. Silvia Edelhuber and Dr. Gerda Führig Fiege for planning and leading this conference. I'd like to thank all the heads of study programs, Professor Dr. Tonka Semla Matosic, Nina Trinke, and Professor Markus Wischow. And I would like to thank all my colleagues who have contributed to the organization, in particular, Alexandra Baldwin, Dr. Josefine Kuhlmann, and Dr. Hannes Breit, and uh, Alexander Scholler and Sarah Reintrecht, too. I wish you an exciting conference as you reflect on the title, Austria in the EU 25 plus one, review and preview, thank you. And now I'm glad to ask our vice rector, Silvia Edelhuber for her welcome words. Welcome to the European Business Forum Burgenland 2021. My name is Silvia Edelhuber and I would like to welcome you as head of the Department of Business Studies and as Vice Rector for Research and Innovation at the University of Applied Sciences. 25 plus one. I was just 25 years old when Austria joined the European Union. And to be honest, I was a bit skeptical. I had just finished my studies with my first few years of work under my belt, I wondered whether the dictum small is beautiful was not the greater proof than supranational confederation of independent states. I wondered if it wouldn't be too difficult to coordinate 15 new countries by that time. At the same time, I was well traveled, studied in Central America and full of curiosity about the world. So I was a cautious EU supporter. Two years later, I worked for the European Parliament. I got to know the way the European Parliament works and was surprised by its efficiency, by the attitude of switching off the microphone after one minute if members of European Parliament did not stick to the speaking time. By the good culture of interaction which was much better than in the national parliament. European cooperation seemed to bring out the best in people. Perhaps out of an effort to be understood in diversity of language reaches. Maybe 
out of the effort to get understanding for one's position in another country. Understanding and comprehension in the EU Parliament instead of conquering and dominating in the national parliament. That made fact-oriented politics possible. And that was the most beautiful thing for me. I'm curious to see what our guests would have presented as their great learning from the EU. I wish Gerda Führig-Twiegel and her many helpers in our department in, and in our, at, in our university all the best for this event today. Thank you very much, Georg Pehm and Silvia Ettelhuber. I would now like to introduce our two interview partners. Heinz Zurek studied economics at the University of Vienna. He worked for the Chamber of Labor and the Austrian Trade Union Federation, as well as the College of the EFTA Surveillance Authority. As soon as Austria became an EU member state in 95, he moved to the EU Commission and started his impressive career as a high-ranking EU official. First, he served as Deputy Director General of the Internal Market DG. After 2001, he headed the Enterprise and Industry DG and afterwards the Taxation and Customs Union DG in the European Commission. Since July 2016, Heinz Zurich serves on the European Commission's Ethics Committee. And what I don't want to leave unmentioned, he is a member of the advisory board that supports the Department of Business Studies at our university. Thank you for being with us, Heinz Zurich. Our second guest You're is You're welcome. Nicole. Thank you. <laughs> our second guest is Nicole Semliak. As I mentioned before, she was born in 95, in the year of Austria's accession to the EU. She's an alumna of our university and graduated with distinction from our bachelor's program, International Business Relations. After that, she earned her master's degree in entrepreneurship and applied management. She also gained international experience during her semester abroad in British Columbia in Canada. Thank you as well for taking part in our event, Ms. Semliak. So, first of all, Mr. Zurek, I'd like to address the first question to you. What was the spirit and the expectation in Austria back in 95 when we became a new member state? I know this question seems to be simple, but I can imagine there are some background information necessary for us to get the big picture. Please, Mr. Zurek. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that I have to give a brief sketch of the historical situation when the accession of Austria and other former EFTA countries like Sweden and uh, Finland happened, because it was a very busy time. At the same time, happened the breakdown of the of the Soviet Empire and the emancipation of a number of countries which formerly have been very much under the rule of the Soviet Union and they were on their way to get democratic countries and to completely overturn the economic uh, performance and on the other hand it was a time when, after the Second World War recovery, a number of uh, other countries also tried to get more integration. This integration happened uh, via two organizations, which was the... Sorry, I've seen that my video has been turned off. Oh, yeah, now we can see you again. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't do anything. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm victim of, of technology. But anyway, it was the European economic uh, rules uh, that, that, were, that were developing in the sense that the former uh, common market or the EC tried to make the next step of 
in, of economic integration to establish what they call the internal market. This internal market would then be exclusively accessible for those member states which were already in the EC. The other countries that didn't want to get into this close, also political cooperation as the EC had envisaged, were members of the European Free Trade Association, EFTA. And now it happened that in this period, when the EC tried to establish its internal market, for in particular for Austria, it turned out to be a big threat to be left out in the cold because our two main economic partners, the biggest or the most important markets for Europe, for the Austrian economy, namely Germany and Italy, have been in the other club, so to say. And it was the threat that we were squeezed like the cheese in the sandwich in between this. And so this is a, a situation where we saw ourselves to be left out. And this would not be so much a threat for the situation of the then status quo, but it would hamper the development. And so uh, a the coincidence was that we could, for the first time, also tr think of becoming a member because the impediment that has been ruling before was that no more veto from the part of the Soviet Union against accession would prevail or would, be, would, be, would have to be expected. So our expectation was to be part of the development to abolish all border restrictions for goods, for services, as well as for people. That means that everybody could uh, move freely. One should not underestimate the fact that at the time when the three EFTA countries uh, joined the European Union, uh, the economic performance of the EU was much more homogeneous than it is nowadays because those countries Sorry, some Can you hear me now? I've seen that that my mic has been turned off. Okay. Well, what we tried to get in brief is be part of the internal market of the European Union. Secondly, to be emancipated from the goodwill of Germany, because we could then sit at the table of negotiating ourselves and would not depend on anybody else to take care of our interests. And thirdly, to be part of the further development of the European integration, also with the perspective of becoming part of the monetary union, which would then, of course, have another uh, positive impact on the economic performance. So it has been mostly driven by economic interest, not to be left out of a development, but to be part of it and to take advantage of this further integration. This, in a nutshell, is the, the, the main expectation that prevailed at the time. Okay, thanks for your answer on that way. Um, I remember when I myself worked in Brussels in 95, it was, everything was new and Austria was often referred to us as the funny new country. Have you also heard this attribution at that time and asked differently, what was the expectation in Brussels towards the new member state, Austria, at that time? Well, frankly speaking, there haven't been too many expectations uh, because we have had already a very strong uh, relationship with our main uh, markets, Italy and Germany. But what has been an expectation was that Austria could be helpful by helping the development of the neighboring countries, the so-called bridging faction to the former Comic-Con countries 
uh, and to have a kind of an, a pivotal role in developing the relationship, which then later on led to the uh, to the accession by those countries that were uh, then uh, at the time left out of the rule from the Soviet Union. And this was the main perspective or main expectation that prevailed in Brussels. Uh, what uh, the, what was has been, what or what has been expected from Austria to perform? Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Semliak. You grew up in an Austria that was already an EU member state. What is the European Union from your point of view? What does the EU mean to you? So, hello everyone from my side. Uh, first of all, and to be honest, to answer this question, when you first asked me if I can join this forum today and you asked, and you asked me what I think about the EU, I was like, oh my God, I have no idea because it's just normal for me, I would say. Um, so I have no spe a special association with it. But um, when I'm asking myself, okay, what is the EU really for me? I would say it's really important in my life. And I think I associate with it open-mindedness, equality, and also um, progress for us as Austria. Um, first and foremost, of course, in terms of education and international economics, but also in terms of languages, travel, politics, environmental goals, and the international economic market. Also, to be honest, before the pandemic, I could never imagine living in a country with closed borders. But now and today, I can, um, you know, I can think about it and I can see, okay, it can be different, but I'm very, very happy to have been grown up in a very peaceful and open Europe. Thank you very much for that, Semliak, uh, Ms. Semliak. Mr. Zurek. What can be said in retrospective after 26 years in the European Union when it comes to Austria's economic development? Well, I think that all the expectations have been over accomplished. That means we performed much better than what could have been expected, but one has You're muted again. Oops. There, I'm Perfect. sorry, there is a constant windows are coming up telling me to not turn off. So now I, I hope <laughs> you can hear me again. Yes, uh, yes. Well, the, the, the point is that there have been two particularly positive developments that one couldn't have expected at the beginning. And Austria has been particularly uh, happy to benefit strongly from two windfall profits. Windfall profit number one was German unification. German unification mean, meant that uh, there was a huge investment from the western part of Germany to the eastern part of Germany, which meant that all the factories run at over capacity and the Austrian industry as a supplier and uh, in strong cooperation with the Germans could benefit from this tremendous increase of the market. But the Austrians didn't have to pay the price for it, contrary to the Germans, because they had to, to bear an extra tax for unification. And we were just sitting at the fence delivering and uh, having, um, in, and, um, having a great impact on the labor market and on our exports performance for free. And the second for free uh, accident has been enlargement because after enlargement, because of proximity to our neighbors like Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland and others, it was extremely easy for both sides to benefit. It has been a difficult situation for the eastern part of Austria because of the 
sudden change in some areas and there have been some competition. Uh, on the other hand, it was, for instance, for the uh, insurance and banking business, it was really a paradise because they could move across the border and serve uh, people uh, in those countries. Uh, and they and they were so taking much more advantage of this enlargement than any other country. Uh, because even Germany was so busy taking care of its own enlargement that the pro rata benefit of enlargement was the highest for Austria. So economically speaking, we did overperform tremendously. Unfortunately, there was a political squeeze at the time that was when the, for the first time in Austria, a government um, of combination of the Conservative Party and the Populist Party, FPÖ, uh, came to office, which then triggered off a kind of a solid political reaction, not an economic one, but the political reaction. And this soured the relations with uh, of a number of people in Austria with the European Union. So it was a kind of a growing uh, gap between the sentiment and the economic benefits. But after all, it has been a very, very fruitful and successful exercise. And Austria, I would consider, is one of the most benefiting countries that ever have joined the European Union. OK, thanks for your answer. I mean, by hearing all these and the milestones came that came after our accession, um, if you do remember, in 94, uh, the pro-European factions campaigned with the slogan, together instead of alone. So, um, I mean, the arguments for a joint economic policy rather than a national, what would you answer for the people? You mentioned it, there were some political, um, some political uh, tendons in Austria. What would you mention by, uh, coming from the conservative uh, part mainly, uh, what would you answer by saying uh, national is much beautiful? Well, it might be beautiful, but it doesn't pay as much. And uh, the point is that you should not forget the smaller an economy and the more open an economy is, the more dependent it is on unhampered market access. Secondly, it is in particular for Austria an absolute benefit that we could get part of a bigger monetary union also for the incoming payments brought by tourists, because this makes it easier for all the tourist sector to calculate their prices and their costs, because there was no more exchange or no, no, no currency risks anymore. So for a, a small country uh, getting into a kind of a combined policy or even have the chance as a small country to have an impact on the policy pursued by big economies like Germany, Italy or France, as we do have in the European Union, would always pay off. So we could have never achieved on our own what we could achieve together. And it is quite clear that also trade relations with third countries were much easier. I have been negotiating as the director general for the customs union with the US, with Japan, with China and others. And it made a difference whether I was sitting there representing 500 million consumers or only 8 million, if I would be sitting there only from the Austrian chair. So it was quite clear that we did benefit from this uh, bringing together. On the other hand, it was always uh, a, a problem in Austria to get some economic reforms done. And it was easier when you could do this together with the other economies, uh, because it was a harmonized approach as we all agreed to do it in a certain way. So there was no impediment on it and the reforms could take place. Sometimes you would have liked it to happen a little bit faster, but overall, I would say that 
the, the benefits of not going on our own are better. And to give you one example, before accession, the per, per capita GDP in Switzerland was one third higher than in Austria. And now we are approximately at the par. That means Switzerland did it on its own. It didn't perform badly, but Austria could catch up because of being part of a bigger entity. Okay, thank you for the answer. My, my next would be, you, you mentioned many advantages already from our uh, membership. So uh, just an idea, what would Austria be or where would Austria be without being in the European Union? Just an idea, uh, where would we be? Well, first of all, it, it would be absolutely uh, awkward if we would be in a similar situation like Switzerland being surrounded only by members of the European Union without having the big financial market than, that Switzerland has. So we would perhaps be uh, in a very, very awkward situation because our market access for exporting our products would be much more difficult and import prices would be much higher because we would have costs at the border clearing and we could not be part of a bigger exercise like the regional funds and the cohesion funds that in particular in the eastern part of Austria uh, were in very important to uh, modernize uh, the economy and to bring up better conditions for the labor market. So we would be in a situation which would not mean that we would all starve or wouldn't, uh, had, uh, wouldn't have uh, a, a living, but I would assume that our uh, disposable income would be remarkably lower, apart from the fact that we would have had a similar problem when crossing borders, not being part of the Eurozone, that means that we would have to bear the currency risks and the other inconveniences like uh, having to show a passport and things like this at the border. Because I think that nowadays anybody who is younger than, let's say, 30 years never experienced any border crossing as being forced to change money or to produce a passport when they were driving, traveling within the European Union. Um, so I think that uh, it, we would still be alive, I think, but it would be performing much worse. Okay, thanks for that. And now uh, a question to somebody who must know it, who is younger than 30 years old, Ms. Semliak. Um, how present was and is the European Union in your personal life? As Mr. Zurek said, you never queued in the, at the borders for in showing your passports expect the yeah. COVID situation, but how present is it to you? So, uh, as already mentioned, the EU was just normal for me. So I always felt like a European and not only like an Austrian, like an Austrian. Um, but I also grew up in the border region with Hungary and in, an, uh, in a Cro Croatian speaking minority in Burgenland. So therefore the EU was somehow always present for me, for example, like with job offers and something like that. But to answer this question, really, I'm trying to split it in different life phases. Um, for example, if I'm thinking back, it started in kindergarten because I do not remember the time when we had shilling, but I remember the time when uh, it changed. So it's still present in my life that my grandparents and the older generation calculates everything in shilling. And I could never imagine like, why? So it's always a discussion and at noon or I don't know. So that's really present in my life. Later in school, um, I also saw the European Union in like board games. So we always learned the EU in a playful way. And the first time I really realized the boundaries of the EU was in college. So I was in the college for occupation in the service industries management. So for the Germans, Speaking, guys, of you, it's Heilwe, like um, a school where we needed to um, complete a 
mandatory internship in a touristic company. And I wanted to work in Croatia as a waitress, but it was 2012 and Croatia wasn't part of the EU and I was under 18, so I didn't get a working permission and I didn't get a visa. So I wasn't allowed to work in Croatia as a waitress. On the other side, my friend and classmate, she had no problem to work in Spain at the same time. Yeah, that was, there were kind of few anecdotes from my uh, school time. Um, but the first time the EU was really present for me, um, it was when I started studying here at the university at my bachelor's degree. Um, and when I started working in the field of research, technology and development. So um, that was the time when I started working in EU projects and I really learned to know the structures behind the EU. Okay, thank you very much. I myself, by the way, I remember also the time when we thought double in euro and in shilling. It was quite a long time. It's, I can imagine that time. Um, but another question to you, Ms. Semliak. Is the EU a topic of conversation among you and your friends? Are you talking about the European Union? I would say somehow yes and no, um, because it depends on the life situa situation. For example, after school, as I already mentioned, uh, the EU was very present for us because we all started studying and working and thinking about all the opportunities that we have. And um, yeah, some of my friends earned their international experience with Erasmus, of course. So that's the, that was the time where we discussed the topics of the EU. But since the EU was um, also kind of normal for us, we never really had a discussion about it because it was just, you know, like there. Um, the only thing I remember, or one thing I remember was a couple of months ago where the data protection from, you know, like WhatsApp changed. And that's where we had the discussion. We were like, okay, should we change the provider? And my friends were like, no, I think we are in the EU, EU so we should be safe. <laughs> um, those were like, kind of some discussions that we had as a friends group, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. So when it comes to be concerned in a personal way, it is a topic obviously in your discussion. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Zurek, as far as uh, the population's the image of the European Union is concerned, Austrians as a whole have always been rather skeptical of the Union. What is the reason for this from your point of view? Well, I wouldn't agree with the statement that they are skeptical about the EU because we still have an approval rate. What it means when, 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 when there is a question, we should rather leave the EU or we should stay on, uh, then it is uh, always a majority that is in favor of staying in the European Union and not leaving. So. Uh, an exit would not have a majority. On the other hand, it is quite clear that because, first of all, it's, it's a constant development and observation in sociology that benefits are taken for granted very soon and taken as a kind of normal way. But when there is things that you don't like, it is always the one that is called to be the, the, the cause for it that is treated with more caution or, um, let's say, adversity. So you can see. Ah, the mic's off. Muted. It is a pattern in many countries that uh, government. Somebody is playing with my mic. Uh, Again. <laughs> okay. Now it seems uh, to work. That, that all the benefits and things that are working well are because of the national government and everything that is un impopular or is, 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 is considered to be a problem is the EU. Secondly, uh, 
I am afraid that the majority of the sorry, I do have now a number of pop ups on my screen. Can you still see me? Yes, we see you. Yeah. We see you and okay. hear you quite clearly. Yeah, okay. Um, that that almost nobody who isn't dealing professionally with this kind of things, either politician or economics, has a clear understanding of what the EU is. It is not considered to be something which is a unification or a, a common approach of the members. It is considered to be a third party somewhere out in Brussels and to be uh, some kind of alien uh, existence. And therefore, it can be rendered guilty for a lot of things or responsible, whether they are now in charge of it or not. The most recent experiment has been the purchase uh, exercise of the vaccine, where all the countries were bundling their commands because they were all deciding on their own which kind of vaccine they would like to have. And then only to get the better bargaining position, the Commission was collecting all these national requirements and collecting together. But because the companies them themselves did deliver in a different way, and some were considered to be faster than the others, it has been the fault of the European Union that this kind of delays or uneven di uh, distribution of the vaccines has happened. So you can see that it is very easy to blame the European Union for something because most people do not even have an idea of what really is now the responsibility for the union or at the national level. But the same goes, one has to admit, at the national level, because most people which are not lawyers or very much interested in the political construction would see the difference between what has been decided by the mayor of a town by the land or at the federal level, because it doesn't matter for them, it is a problem that they like or dislike. So the more distant an entity is considered to be, the easier it is also blamed for faults or for other things. And again, as this adds up with the, uh, let's say, banalization of the advantages it brings, uh, this can turn a kind of a, a feeling in in the population that they are not uh, as useful or as helpful as they call themselves or as they are considered by other people which have an, a better insight into this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very interesting. Ms. Semliak, what is your impression regarding the public opinion on the EU among your fellow Austrians? Um, well, as I already mentioned, I would say among my friends and like my generation, I would say in the first place positive, of course, especially in terms of the open borders, travel, trade, immigration, safety and like mutual support. Um, but I would also say there are many things that scare us, like the ongoing climate crisis, maybe the future job market and also kind of cyber crime. So to be honest right now, it kind of feels like um, my generation has not really an optimistic view into the future. But I wouldn't say that's because of the European Union, but uh, the e European Union could maybe help to make it better for us. And um, yeah, I mean, please don't get me wrong, but the pandemic kind of gave us a reality check, I would say. and. In the end, I think my generation is very open-minded and understands that together we are stronger and therefore we believe in the EU and in the future. Okay, thank you for that. We come to the COVID point right, uh, right after. Just before I have another topic, uh, I would like to ask you more on the economic uh, point. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Zurek, how does the EU compare in terms of being a, an economic engine compared to the US and Asia, especially China. Does it still run? 
Well, yes, certainly it is it is running, uh, but my concern is rather uh, how does it perform in comparison to other uh, economies? And there, of course, we can witness for some time now a big rise in the economic power of China. We can see that there is a very robust economic performance of the United States and that the economic importance of the European continent or union is diminishing. And there are several elements which are at the, the cause of this. First cause is demography. Uh, we are all facing an aging population. That means that the European countries, we even now have got uh, for the second consecutive year in Finland, a reduction in the number of the active population because they have too few young people coming to the age of entering the labor market and there are more leaving the labor market to retirement than are coming new. So it, this is the first time that we have seen in peaceful times a reduction in manpower uh, for the labor market. The other is that Europe has, has turned to be rather peculiar with regard to science. There is a deeply rooted hate against science. They hate everything which has to do with rational thinking and with uh, science. There mustn't be any genes in, in, in Europe. There mustn't be any atoms in Europe. There mustn't be any chemicals in Europe. There only have to be sunshine and bright uh, water. <laughs> so we have ch the, 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 the reason why we have seen such a, a, a difficulty with getting the pharmaceutical is because for the last 30 years, we have been chasing out pharmaceutical industry from Europe because there has been this absolute aversion against gene technology and all modern pharmaceuticals are produced on the basis with gene technologies. So all the German pharma industry had to replace their national research centers and move to the United States or to India. And that's the reason why we have created this dependence. And if we continue this way, that we are uh, not considering how we can make use of new technologies, we will fall back further in future. We are about to lose also the access to the, let's say, front runners in the digital economy. Uh, this is of the one, on the one hand a technological problem, and the other it is the problem that, for instance, uh, anybody who is selling for the first time or producing for the first time any IT solution does it in America. He has got at most two languages to serve, English and Spanish, and they have got an, a market which is very homogeneous for all the participants. We do have in Europe uh, to serve many more languages if there would be an app or something else uh, developed. And therefore, the number of customers is much more difficult to generate in Europe than it would be in the United States. And on top of it, it is very different from the approach that people have for new technology. So my perspective is that, <coughs> that the European Union will continue to perform highly in the field of the services and intellectual creation of intellectual property. But I am hesitant to see that we could compete with the front running technologies uh, that are now uh, dominating the markets. So the engine is still running, but it is much weaker than it would be elsewhere in the world. 
Okay, that's um, uh, interesting um, and a little bit dark, a dark, a dark view, by, especially when, you, when we are in the university and uh, you say this uh, trust in science is uh, not that, that high, that's uh, tremendous. But uh, coming back to one thing you mentioned is the digitalization. I mean, uh, do you think that Europe missed the boat already? Uh, because Ursula von der Leyen, when she started her, her uh, being president of the European Commission, she, she said, we have to invest on this digitalization. We have to develop a strategy because uh, maybe the first boat we missed, but we have to take the second one. What uh, is your impression on that? Well, first of all, I think the term digitalization is not telling us everything that is really behind it because we are just at the beginning of an exercise. I used to compare the progress or the process of digitalization with electrification. When electricity was rolled out, it was done so in the first place for uh, to, to, to get uh, light into the houses. It was the kind of electric bulb was the symbol. And it was very difficult for people to imagine that uh, everything else would be running on electricity. So we are now in the situation where compared with the electrification, we have been in the 19, let's say 20s or so, when things were still rolling out. And therefore the market for digital applications is exploding and we will certainly have a role to play. On the other hand, uh, it is quite clear that a lot of issues which are impeding the digital uptake is because of the lack of infrastructure. It is not yet clear that we could have a high speed link to all households or companies as we would need. You can see that a number of people are running up and de making demonstrations against the rollout of 5G because they consider that this is something which is dangerous. We can see that there is another point that is uh, specific in the digital world as we can see it now is that there is a winner takes it all performance. So you see the first one, uh, you, you don't have a competition amongst uh, let's say comparably sized companies as you do have in steel industry or in car industry or elsewhere. Uh, if you are running uh, a particularly successful uh, application, you will have conquered the whole market like Facebook or uh, as as Windows did it for the for the PCs and so on. So there there is a different nature in this in this in this market but more and more digital uh, applications and use are coming up and there i see that europe will certainly have a role to play because if there is any raw material in europe that is here in abundance it's gray cells in the brains of young people thank you for that good word miss semliak uh, you work in the field of research and therefore deal with issues of the future. What role does the EU play for you in terms of digitalization? So, first of all, I would agree to the answer of Heinz Zurich. Um, I also think that the EU plays a very important role in terms of digital, digitalization in Europe. So, uh, for example, currently the EU is funding so-called digital innovation hubs. And um, the aim of those hubs is to provide infrastructure and know-how for companies and the public. So the responsibility of the EU is to provide the right structures and the funds to drive the progress forward. And I think the responsibility of the countries and of us is to use these hubs to promote digitalization throughout Europe. So I think um, also that the EU is very important in terms of education, so to giving the right structures and the right directions for us. Okay, thanks for that. I 
come nearly to my last question. Uh, you mentioned it before. Uh, let's look at the current at the current situation. What do you see as the biggest economic challenges the EU faces in a post-corona pandemic world? First, again, Ms. Semliak and then uh, Mr. Zurek. Ms. Semliak, please. Yeah, I think that's a very tough question, <laughs> to be honest. But um, I would say the financial consequences of the pandemic, of course, and who will pay for it. Um, also, the and very important, the climate crisis and all the re resulting facts and the future job market in terms of digitalization, but also maybe the change of work attitude. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Mr. Zurek, what is your point of view? Well, I think that it, I also agree uh, with Nicole. I, I think that you have to distinguish between the short term and the, the mid or longer term challenges. Yeah. The short term is, of course, a give a response to ease the recovery after the and the overcoming the effects of the pandemic. That is, of course, the immediate. But there, I think we are on a good way to establish uh, instruments. However, in the long run, we also have to address of the growing inequalities in the distribution of the benefits of both the economies nationally at, as, as well as between countries. So this kind of negative globalization effects have to be addressed also in the economic policy. The other part is in the longer run is uh, the response to the climate change, because this will uh, force us to change a lot of our behaviors, both the way we consume as well as we produce, as well as we dispose of our waste. So these are these are really big things. But I think that there is one element which I am very skeptical whether we can really uh, make success in this is the re-establishment of a rule-based world trade uh, organization or world trade system because after the development that we have seen in the past five years in the united states and the spat that they had with with with, with china at the same time the uh, that the problem that the, the working of the W2 panel system has been more or less destroyed deliberately by the United States makes it very difficult for smaller countries and for developing countries to get their place in the world as well as the United Union, uh, as, the, as the European Union, because we all depend on a rule-based and uh, all and, and, and broadly accepted a set of rules how we uh, work together economically. So these are the biggest challenges that I see ahead of us. Thank you very much. I now come really to my last question. I mean, uh, this interview was just me asking you the questions. Now it's uh, you. Uh, do you have question, vice versa? So Ms. Semliak, is there a question you would like to ask Mr. Zurek? Yeah. So. If it would be possible, would you rather be born uh, like me in the existing European Union and you would be still young? Or are you happy that you grew up in an Austria before the European Union? Well, first of all, I would not have any problem of being <laughs> young again. However, I have to admit that I am a member of the happiest and gladdest generation that ever lived in Europe. I have didn't have a single day of war. I didn't have a single day of uh, fame in my life. And I always were witnessing a kind of a constant increase in economic wealth and in peace and in a common uh, approach among, amongst countries. So. In fact, I am not unhappy that I lived exactly in the period I was living. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks for that. My question, yes, however, please. is... Yes, uh, please. You partly already answered it by your personal, uh, by your personal experience that you had in, at school, because I was wondering when, when you... Uh, the European Union gives you an easy access to work in another country. 
leaving apart the fact that you also would be better off, you could speak the language they speak in this country. Uh, would you think that this is in comparison to an invitation to work abroad? Would this make a difference for you whether you can work in the country which is also a member of the European Union or which is a third country? Yeah, so I would say um, it depends. <laughs> That's always a very political is. answer, right? <laughs> well, it depends. If it would be just for a period, like just for experience, it wouldn't really matter for me. But if I would like to emigrate to another country, I would always choose a country from the European Union because there are the rules and you can feel kind of safe because you know you are a community and yeah, you have the culture and everything and you can just make use of the European Union. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks to both of you. It was really great to have you here in this interview, but please uh, stay with us. I now, uh, um, I'm now asking my colleague, Sarah, what about the comments from the audience? Are there any questions for our two interview partners? Oh, yes, here we go. Was the disintegration of Yugoslavia one of the reasons to join EU for Austria? Since Austria is one of the close neighboring country that could have affect Austria so hard than other region. Was that uh, clear to understand? I think it has had no impact on this decision. It was only a shock uh, in particular for Austria because it was for the first time after World War II that we saw that this kind of dreadful fighting within the country happened. And uh, to give you one example, at the time, I was still working with the Austrian trade unions. And we had to organize an ethnic, ethnical cleansing of companies because people that came from your former Yugoslavia that were working together for years after the breakout of the war in, uh, in Yugoslavia started to get hostilities amongst themselves. And so we had to organize companies that all the Serbs came to one company, all the Croats to another country, the Montenegrinians to a third. So it was an experience that made it only clear how close war can be among uh, you are you muted again somebody is uh, playing yeah okay again again muted sorry yes yeah now so it has not been an immediate uh uh course but it reinforced the importance of having the European Union as a peace project. Okay, there is a, a next point. It was interesting point of view from a generation that grew up with Austria as part of the EU. I'm curious to know what is the sentiment from older generation where Austria was not yet part of the EU. Mr. Zurich, in your interview, in your view, how much was Austria prepared to influence EU policy when it entire the EU in 95? Was there a clear vision from the Austrian government how, to, how it wanted to influence the EU? So there were two questions, I think. The first was, uh, how was it for somebody to grow up when Austria was not the EU, part of the EU? And the second one was uh, um, the influence um, on the vision from Austria government, how it wanted to influence the European Union. You're muted again. Mr. Zurich, <laughs> yes, no, not yet. Yeah. Uh, is, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, it, it, it has been considered
you are muted again. And it did. Yeah. I, I don't know. I have constantly windows popping up and turning off my mic. Uh, so the, the, the point was that uh, it was in foresight of a possible discrimination that the decision to join happened. So we were just in the same bandwagon like the others that were developing because the internal market of the European Union. Again, the mic thing. Uh, that happened uh, at the time. Uh, so, so it 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 was it was a kind of a taking advantage of the achievements at the same pace as those that have been there in the European Union before. So we felt as being part of a bigger uh, group that were benefiting from further integration. To the second question, I have to admit that I have not seen a great uh, design or interest of the Austrian government to play an active role in the European Union beyond uh, preserving their own uh, interest. And, and so I see that this is something which is uh, rather a kind of a silent uh, participation uh, then, then it would be a kind of a very active role. And on the other hand, it was also clear that, uh, that Austria never achieved a kind of a uh, uh, being part of a, of a group that was uh, uh, particularly interested in a kind of uh, pursuing a policy they only were opposing to gene modification. That's the only active role that I, I saw, but it was never a kind of a bigger plan. And, and, and so I cannot see that there has been a real active role on the other. They were constantly trying to uh, support the development and the further integration of, of the European project. Okay, thanks for that. Another question, not on the economic, but uh, on policy, let's call it that way. How do you assess the further development of the model of illiberal democracies in the European Union? So the question of uh, illiberal democracies. Well, I consider this to be the biggest threat and it is not only that there is a kind of a tendency to illiberal uh, uh, democracies in some countries, it is also that within our societies, we are at a development which is very, very uh, scary in the sense that we see more and more loss of debate culture in politics. We see a very strong uh, increase of, uh, let's say, uh, aggressiveness in the way of how, how people uh, are, are conducting uh, exchanges, and that this is also a kind of a fatigue of respect of, um, of uh, democratic institutions, as we can also see nowadays in Austria, that there is a kind of a uh, a, a kind of decrease in the respect of the rule of law. Thanks for that. Another question in addition to that, what we heard before, what in your personal opinion, why Austria has not taken an active role in the European Union, generally speaking? So the role of Austria in the European Union. Um. It's difficult for me to, uh, to, to, to give a, a valid response to this. In my view, it is the fact that there has not been any particular development which was uh, hitting on us uh, negatively, but we were always sitting uh, on, the, on the side of those which were uh, harvesting uh, 
the say free ride benefits like I, I i told you with the german unification as well as with the uh with uh with enlargement so uh people that are happy don't develop any particular uh need to 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 get things uh done differently and and for me it was that the european or the, the austrian policies have been happy with the way the union ran and they were happy that they didn't have to think themselves but they could rely on the input from coming from from the european union <laughs> okay that's a very positive way just have a look is there another question not yet but we will have the opportunity uh, after our second part so but for the moment uh, mr zurich and dear miss semliak i would really like to warmly thank you for the interview and uh, for taking part in the discussion. I look forward to having you join us again for our preview discussion after our break, of after our uh, next part, our keynote speaker. After our interview with Heinz Zurek and Nicole Semliak, who shared their personal reviews, let us take a glimpse into the future. Last year, the corona pandemic massively shook the foundations of the European Union. What have we learned from this? What will the EU look like in 25 years time, especially in economic terms? I'm very glad that we could win Anna Heenberger from the think tank Momentum Institute in Vienna for our event. She will share trends and developments concerning economic issues in the European Union. Before I hand over the floor, let me briefly introduce Ms. Heenberger. After studying business administration in Vienna and spending some time abroad, Anna Heinberger switched to political economy and, learned, and earned her master's degree in London at the Kingston University. Her main areas of research are budget, gender economics, environmental economics, and regional development. Ms. Heinberger, the floor is yours. Hello and thanks for inviting me. I'm just quickly sharing my build my screen. Give me a second, because I prepared a fine. little presentation. Can everybody see this? Yes, fine, I can see it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So yeah, um, thank you for having me. Um, this is a quick uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, statement on Austria and the EU. And um, I'm happy to be here. I want to split my statement into two parts. Uh, in part one, I uh, want to discuss the future of the EU. For, for, no, wrong. In part one, I feel like in order to discuss the future of the EU, I first want to concentrate on what the status quo is currently in three areas. That would be economic, social, and political. And especially for the European Union, the Eurozone, and uh, for the nations, um, in between those um, areas. I feel like this is important to identifying where Europe needs to get active, which we will discuss in a shorter second part. And in part two, I want to discuss coming out of the evaluation of the status quo, where the challenges lie and how we need to overcome them as a solidary Europe. And I also have to say the topic is very, very broad and within 20 minutes, I can barely cover everything which is why I'm especially looking forward to discussing with my panel partners, Mr. Zurek and Ms. Simlak, as well as with you, our audience, in the following. We start with a very quick glance on the size of European economies, and I guess you're not really surprised to see that in Europe, we got economies of different sizes. Um, you see Germany is Europe's economic powerhouse, um, and we can also see that with the Brexit, we lost not only a central part of our society, but also of our economic might. In total, the EU 27 had an GDP in 2019 of 13,900 billion euros. Barely, supply, whoop, barely surprising, um, we've got economies of different sizes in the European Union. Taking a further look, however, into economic figures, the current account in German Leistungsbilanz gives us a sense of how these economies behave as compared to the rest of the world. 
And we again see that Germany's, uh, Germany has a strong positive current account balance, um, which is almost four times higher than that of the Netherlands, for example. And the current account summarizes all transactions, expenditures and incomes from a country with the rest of the world. Returning to that large positive surplus of Germany, this means that Germany sells more to the rest of the world than it buys from it. However, and that is very important, if a nation sells a lot and does not buy the same amount back, another nation needs to consume or another nations need to consume more than they sell to the world. And then they incur current account deficits like we see on the right hand of that graph like Greece or Romania. However, nations can only import if citizens have access to credit or enough income to buy stuff abroad. I just want to quickly summarize the economic figures, which we just saw, and uh, very swiftly go over what kind of dynamics economic heterogeneity within a common currency union, such as, for example, the euro area could trigger. We've got the Maastricht criteria in uh, the euro area, and their aim is to secure economic convergence of the countries in the euro area. As we've seen, however, even though these criteria are there, we've still got some imbalances in the sizes of economies and also differences in how they operate. We just saw the current account deficit um, with strong export-oriented Germany, for example. These economic imbalances triggered a difficult reaction of the euro area in combating the financial crisis. When national debt levels skyrocketed after massive bank bailouts, mostly northern and heavily exporting countries demanded debt-burdened countries that rather imported before to consolidate the national finances. This is in so far also interesting because, for example, Germany exported a lot to Greece and therefore earned a lot of money by that practice. However, the triggered austerity measures prolonged the crisis in Europe, we will see that on the next slide, and created mass unemployment and cut back social states in the nation states. Also, because as we heard before, countries can only buy from others if they have the income or access to credit to do so. Austerity measures taken by European countries have implications for all other countries as well. In this way, Austria, for example, lost more than 30,000 euro in value added per capita since 2009. So let's see how, for example, the US managed the crisis in comparison to Europe on the next slide. I'm, uh, I need to apologize, I have this graph only in uh, German. Uh, I go over it quickly, it's quite um, self-describing anyways. The two lines here show the development of real GDP. And we very clearly see why the US recovered steadily after 2009 by implementing an expansive, an expansive spending policy. The Eurozone implemented harsh austerity measures, demanding countries like Greece, for example, to minimize spending and cut back their social welfare. This tactic prolonged the crisis in the Eurozone and led to a double-digit recession, as you can see here. The austerity measures were mostly built on the lack of solidarity of wealthy export-oriented countries like Germany or Austria to aid struggling countries. The latter debt increased largely because they bailed out banks who held or were invested with too many defaulting financial products, and those would be the famous asked-backed securities. This lack of solidarity within the euro area caused the economic recession, as we already said, to stay longer and southern European countries to still face massive unemployment and poverty rates. Especially, and I only told you all of this right now, because especially in light of the current corona crisis, which started as a health crisis, but is now already for quite a long time an economic crisis too, the danger lies in repeating these mistakes by implementing austerity. Um, related to that, we also take a swift glance on unemployment rates in uh, the European countries in comparison of the years 2006, 2009, 2013 and 2019. And we um, very show skyrocketing rates for Croatia, Greece, Spain, Portugal or Cyprus as a reaction to uh, the global financial crisis and the prolonged recession in Europe. And um, we also see less dramatic consequences for other countries. This means that 
the financial crisis had long standing and very unequal consequences. And um, the European Union reacting in order to save the Maastricht criteria, for example, having a certain debt level, um, cost, sorry, of having <laughs> economic indicators went not so well. What the austerity programs did, however, is what we see here with this graph, um, and they created mass unemployment. Also now, the situation looks a bit dire. The newest Eurobarometer index asking Europeans of the current job situation shows that 27% of all people asked said they judged the situation quite bad. Another important economic figure concerns income and wealth distribution. Uh, for example, in Austria, one percent of the population owns one quarter of total wealth. Turning to income distribution and the graph displayed here, we can see clearly that the figures um, show the annual income of the upper 20 percent of households compared to the bottom of 20 percent. The ratio then gives us that in the EU 27 on average, the top 20 percent earn five times more than households in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. And this ratio is especially high in Bulgaria, even showing an increase between 2010 and 2019. This is also mirrored by uh, the Eurozone and the EU27 since 2010, both show an increasing ratio. Um, and an IMF study in Bulgaria shows that absolute poverty has dropped markedly in Bulgaria, but income inequality has increased substantially in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And this increase is due to a rise in market income inequality that was compounded by a reduction in fiscal redistribution. And again, with respect to the current risk developments, the authors also state the COVID-19 crisis is likely to deepen income inequality, increasing, therefore, the room for redistributive policies. enough of uh, income distribution now. However, there's another problem coming with the lack of solidarity between uh, European nation states. Tax evasion, for example, is big and most countries are negatively affected by inner European tax competition, which leads corporate tax rates into vicious downward circles in order to try to attract company investments. Austria alone lost over 745 millions in 2020. A lot of it even to European member states like Malta, Ireland or the Benelux countries. The European Union itself loses around 50 to 70 billion euros a year because of corporate profit shifting. This, however, is money we could use to create jobs to combat that massive unemployment and also have improved social security. Coming to social figures now. How are we as Europeans doing? Economic policy and circumstances have far-reaching consequences for the lives we live in Europe. Too many over 16-year-olds cannot afford to go and see a doctor. We will have a look at that on the next slide. 91 million people in the EU27 lived 2019 at risk of poverty or were socially excluded. The gender, gap, gender pay gap in the EU lies at 14.4%. In Austria, even a lot higher by 20.4%. Financial and economic independency is also closely linked to violence against women. In 2017, 854 women have been killed by either their partners or family members in only 16 countries of the EU because we had uh, no data for all the other countries. This makes more than two women a day. In Austria currently, 12 women have been killed in 2021 by their partners so far. Also, where you stand on the social ladder is still strongly dependent on your family history. In the EU, only three out of 10 people achieve higher education when neither parents nor grandparents or fathers have a higher education. But eight out of 10 people do so when both parents and grandparents have a higher education. That means family history matters also more in Southern and Eastern Europe than in the North of Europe. Let's, um, especially in light of the current COVID-19 health crisis, uh, this figure a bit uh, more in detail. In the rich European Union, there are countries where seeing a doctor is too expensive for a lot of people. 
The percentage of over 16 year olds who do not go to a doctor in order to undergo medical examination is overall low, but also here we see big imbalances within the European countries. And this is another clear example of how economic policy affects every aspect of citizens' lives because if states need to consolidate their debt, for example, and therefore could social provision of healthcare or social spending in general, less people can afford to, for example, given, go to see a doctor. In Greece, this was even up to 12% in 2016. For Austria, the rate of above 16 year olds not to be able to afford going to see a doctor is quite similar to Germany on a very low level. The question is, how can we change stuff like this? And the answer is by politics. And here I want to say that probably Mr. Zure can tell us a bit more about the political landscape and decision making in uh, Europe later on in our decisions, uh, in our discussions. I just want to highlight some facts about who takes decisions in the European Union and the basic institutions, which probably all of you know are the Council of the European Union, <clears throat> where the ministers of national governments take decisions following the general agenda, which the European Council sets. The European Commission um, is the main executive body and it has one member from each member state. Um, the European Parliament <coughs> sorry, uh, is the only directly uh, elected institution with 705 members. Um, and the European Central Bank, I don't have that one on the slide now, um, who is 25 governing counts members. Uh, who counts 25 governing council members, six are appointed by the European Council, and uh, 19 are the governors of the 19 Euro states. However, especially in light of the global financial crisis and the prolonged European debt crisis, criticism on European policymaking arose. For example, Joachim Becker writes that the EU institutions or the interlocking multi-level form of EU policy formulation are effectively shielded against pressure from below. With this statement, he means that the European Union does not really take into account the interests of the ordinary people, of EU citizens like you and me. Let's have a look why that could be the case. Let us take the example of female representation in decision-making positions in the European Union institutions. While women represent half of the population in the EU, they barely reach this 50% in the EU institutions. We see the Council of the European Union, the women's shares by approximately 29% and so on and so forth. We would also, like shifting to a national level, it would also take us another 12 years to achieve gender balance. However, talking of diversity in parliaments, the share of workers in the Austrian parliament lies at 1%. 26% of the total population in Austria are workers. The ratio in comparison to that for self-employed, however, lies at 34%, while the ratio of total population of self-employed is only 11%. Hence, workers and women are underrepresented in political decision-making, while males and self-employed are overrepresented. The consequences of this kind of decision-making by only a few groups of the wider population is that the interests will be overly represented in decision-making too. A study from Germany clearly shows it does make a difference if women make decisions. When a woman won a direct duel against a male candidate in local elections, Gemeinderatswahlen in German, municipal spending on childcare increased 40% faster than in other comparable municipalities. Hence, it does matter who sits where and what decisions are made is directly influenced by who makes the decision. However, not only the representation of decision makers in parliaments or institutions are important, we also need to acknowledge the influence money plays. Another study from Germany shows intriguingly that the interest of the top income group have a higher probability of actually becoming politics than the interests of lower earning groups. We have here, for example, if the top income group consents to a certain policy, policy change by 80%, the probability of implementation of that certain policy change is over 72%. 
Comparing to that, if 80% of the bottom income group accepts or is for a certain policy change, the probability of, implementation, of implementation of that policy change lies at only 46%. Also, interestingly, interestingly the latest Eurobarometer from 2021 again shows that 45% of Austrians surveyed were of the opinion that the EU was basically moving into the wrong direction. That is seven, per, seven percentage points more than in the fall of 2019. And this short analysis of the democratic situation in Europe and its nation states does not even take into account rising illiberal tendencies of some European countries as we had just heard in the discussion and the questions of the audience before. Hence, the status quo is a European Union of 27 countries and a Europe area of 19 countries where key economic and social indicators have sometimes not improved enough or even worsened over the last years. The question of how we want to live in 2025 is closely related to necessarily acknowledging current deficits and problems. And the topics I've talked about are so far are mirrored in the concerns of the broader European population. Again, the Eurobarometer asks citizens what they thought are the most important issues they are facing at the moment. 33% said the economic situation. 25% said it is unemployment. And 44% said, and that is not really surprising, the health crisis. Hence, we now look very swiftly at two identified rooms for improvement from the evaluation of the status quo, income and social inequality, and further need for deepened democratic decision-making and inclusion. Another and very pressing topic is the need for hurrying up in fighting the climate crisis. Let's have a look. We all know about the climate crisis by now. This graph shows where we can still live if we heat up the earth by four degrees. It clearly shows barely somewhere. This means that we need a full change of how we live and work in order to reach the 1.5 degrees goal. This includes a radical transformation of our industries and our mobility, implemented on supranational and national levels, and supported by an active central bank, also concerned with employment goals instead of solely focusing on price stability. Overcoming the inequalities in social and economic spheres need public employment programs against unemployment and for transformation on labor markets, especially in a time where companies have, do not have the resources to create jobs themselves. We need also, the government can create very, 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 very necessary jobs in care, for example, and in ecological industries. And I've got a figure for you here. A care-led recovery even creates 5% more jobs than ordinary stimulus packages or oriented at, for example, physical infrastructure, such as highway um, construction. We also need social transfers, and we also need to fight against tax evasion and harmful corporate business tactics. We need social transfers because they have the, the potential to risk poverty, to reduce the risk of poverty in the EU on average by a third. In Austria, it's even almost by 50%. We also need money for violence prevention and childcare facilities because this is key in supporting women and minorities. And instead of losing 50 to 7 billion of taxes because of corporate profit shifting each year, we need transparency and stricter laws, for example, through country by country reporting. Also, implementing a supply chain law in order to end harmful business behavior by corporations and securing workers' rights and environmental justice. <clears throat> Sorry. With investment into our economies and societies, we can make all economists and citizens profit from the European project, instead of engaging in a vicious downward spiral triggered by competing with each other. We also need, as Mr. Pim said in his opening speech, more democracy in the European Union and the Eurozone. This includes, among others, the following steps. Decision in the EU institutions and national governments, mark making, must be more, made more transparent and democratic. Reducing economic inequality on individual level also reduces inequality in democratic power. Therefore, we can use wealth taxes, inheritance taxes, also the financial transaction tax. 
increasing representative balance in public and private decision making is key in considering all interests adequately. And this we can do, for example, with women's quotas. <clears throat> And also regularly including direct citizens' views as the Citizen Forum in France already did or the Conference on the Future of Europe right now does. I am well aware that all of these sound like big steps, but the European Union and the Eurozone have already stepped up the game and also try not to repeat the austerity misery again in light of the stimulus packages for a strong, solidary recovery of the European economy and society. And to be honest, we also need to face that there's simply no alternative to improve our action and accelerate it with regard to the climate crisis. I personally strongly think by including citizens, strengthening our national, but also the European democracy will enable us to actively shape our future, building equal and good living conditions for every European citizens. And with that, I say thanks for having me and I'm super looking forward to discussion with you. Thank you very much, Anna Heidenberger. There were many, many points in it and I can imagine there are many points for also for our audience uh, which are interested in, in questions. So please uh, think about the questions. Meanwhile, um, I would like, first of all, uh, turn the floor over again to our two interview partners. Uh, to Heinz Zurek and Nicole Semeliak, first of all, what is your perspective on the insights or findings or of, of uh, Ms. Heenberger? And of course, on the future of the EU in general. So first of all, I would like to ask you, Mr. Zurek, and afterwards, Ms. Semeliak, before I come back to the questions from the audience. But first of all, Mr. Zurek, the floor is yours. Thank you. May I first ask whether you can hear me now? Because it seems that there has been a bug in my in my headset, so I tried to do it now with this mic. Well, first of all, many thanks for this presentation, and for some highlighting some of the biggest challenges. I entirely agree with it. The the, the only part that I see is that uh, you did not really show how pro-cyclical the economic circle has been in the past, let's say, 10 years, which were increasing the uh, inequalities in distribution and, on the other hand, uh, explaining the difference between the curve that we saw about the United States and Europe uh, in the increase uh, in the GDP. Uh, I have now a great hope that uh, this kind of uh, the change in the political or economic orientation that has started with the new program with the first time that the European Union can uh, get money from the capital market on its own uh, can turn into a kind of a more uh, anti-cyclical and more Keynesian policy and leaving back behind a little bit this kind of neoclassical obsession uh, of the budget uh, discipline. Uh, however, one has to admit that it is not all about budgetary uh, problems, because at present, the main discipline is put on the way how uh, countries spend money. And it is too little on how they generate the revenues. And there we see an increase in the inequalities of the contribution from the different sources for income. That means that we have a constant tendency over the past 30 years that taxes on labor constantly increase. However, taxes on capital gains constantly were decreased. And this is something which is a problem. However, I I have been trying to get a financial transaction tax going when I was in charge, and I saw that there was a strong resistance against it. But I'm optimistic about something different that has to do to the, with the climate change. We made a proposal to change energy taxation, uh, to uh, go away from the present very outdated system where you just 
put a, a, a simple lump tax on a quantity, for instance, per liter of fuel or a ton of coal or whatever it is, and to split it into, on the one hand, the uh, real energy content of an energy product, and on the other hand, the pollution it creates, the CO2, and combine the pricing that we should put on CO2 emissions as integral part of the taxation. But this has been stopped uh, immediately by uh, the traffic uh, companies, which were opposing to tax diesel fuel in a kind of a just way, because they consider that they were put at a, uh, a, a, well, they were losing an advantage. So the point is not so much only to change the European, uh, let's say, framework and enable the, the European Union to do things, but also to work on the attitudes that are prevailing in the member states, because they will, in tax issues, still remain the main players, uh, whatever we like or not. Thank you. So would you like to answer directly, Ms. Heenberger? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, thank you, Mr. Turk. I'm well aware that I did not cover all the points possible at all. <laughs> Um, but what you say is a critical point because um, especially that dynamic between the nation state legislation uh, making and then also the legislation making on European level is uh, very critical in finally approaching majorities for a proper change in so many ways, in so many areas which we need. Um, it, perfect example is um, national tax legislation, but also national as well as European um, democratic institutions are influenced by outside players, which are not democratically elected, for example. And that again is also a major challenge in having any kind of progress in that view. And that is what I was also very keen on making very clear and um, in my presentation. And that is why maybe all other or some other factors got a bit more in the background. So thanks on your comments and I'm super appreciating um, any more ideas and comments of both of you. Okay, by the way, what is your opinion, Ms. Semliak? Uh, what, do you, what do you think on the perspective points and the situation where we are? I maybe have another question for Mr. Zurek. Um, could you maybe explain me somehow? Today I read uh, in the newspaper about the new nuclear power institution in, in Slovakia, which is going to open. How much influence has the European Union on, like, on national level in terms of power? Should I? Yes, please go yeah, ahead. Or both. I, I don't know which one. Well, yes, I mean, it's an, another topic, but of course, it's uh, quite current, quite <laughs> actual, as we heard Sorry, in the yeah. news. Basic, basically, basically uh, there is no influence in the choice of uh, how energy is produced and consumed in the member states. And the only uh, inroad for a European level in this would be either by... Uh, environmental legislation, that means uh, emissions uh, uh, limits and things like this, and or security issues like the Euratom uh, Treaty gives a clear indication on what kind of treatment nuclear fools uh, have to comply with. But the decision on whether a country is opting for nuclear power or for coal, uh, like in the case of, of Poland, remains a purely national mm -hmm. uh, And the other point that I was, uh, I, I cannot really understand that now after so long time, it hasn't even been possible to link the two electricity grids from Eastern Europe and Central and Western Europe by more than two links. That means that we have still two 
more or less entirely independent um, electricity grids in, in, in the east of Europe and in the west of Europe, uh, which renders the change over to, uh, let's say, sustainably uh, produced electricity much more difficult because you, it is not good enough to, to produce it. You also have to bring it to where it is needed. And this is the grid. And there it is not done. So uh, the, the fact that uh, one country is running a nuclear power plant, as long as they are uh, in kind of uh, observing all the limitations that are laid down by the environmental and or the uh, Euratom uh, regulation, you have no inroad for the European uh, level in this kind of decision making. You may regret it, but this is the present situation of the treaties. Okay, thank you very much. And that's thank you. a very current question and the very current topic. I am now would like to ask the audience, uh, first of all, my colleague Sarah, what about the comments from the audience? Are there any questions for our speaker? There are, seems to be no questions because we had uh, really very much topics uh, in the last uh, in the last 20 minutes just to summarize a little bit we had the point on democracy in the european union uh, we had the point with the gender and uh, the the workers who are underrepresented in the uh, the parliament also the decision making process in the european union was a point uh, a next point were probably uh, might be very interesting also for the students is the tax story, let's call it that way, the taxation of the corporates uh, versus, as uh, Mr. Zurek also told us, the taxation of the workers, of the labor law, and uh, in comparison to the, comp to the companies. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, point. And last but not least, of course, uh, the service outcome coming from the Eurobarometer on uh, what's most interesting for 25, 2025, it's uh, not really surprisingly the point of jobs, uh, the point of health crisis, and of course also the point of um, climate crisis, which is a very actual point uh, as well. So I'm looking at the chat. Ah, there is a question about the corporate tax refusal. Do you see any tendency inside the union for a policy change? If not so far, could the increased incomes of internet giants bring some change? I think that's a question, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Heenberger and maybe afterwards Mr. Zurek. Please, Ms. Heenberger. Thank you. That's a totally important question. Um, as far as I know, and I guess Mr. Zurek can correct me if that's not the latest um, information, um, there is ongoing ongoing debate about the country per country by country reporting, which is um, a transparency act, so to say, requiring companies uh, above a certain um, above certain sales to report where they um, shift their profits to to which kind of countries, and studies show that already that kind of transparency requirement can significantly decrease the profit shifting of corporations, which then uh, leads to higher tax incomes for nation states. Mr. Zurek, is that, it's still discussed, right? Mr. Zurek, what Well, I think, yes, it is, it is one element in a bigger uh, exercise. Uh, the exercise that is called profit shifting uh, and tax and and, 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 and and the proper tax base erosion is uh, an ongoing debate for let's say 10 years. Um, however, there was an interruption in this by the Trump administration and now the new president, Mr. Biden, he has made really a big, big, big step in the right direction by again increasing the uh, corporate tax uh, that Mr. Trump lowered from 35 to 21%. He wants to get it up back to 28, 
but more importantly that he wants to have an agreement that we were pushing for already for 10 years of a minimum tax globally that means that when you are shifting your profits from one jurisdiction to another where there is a lower tax that at least you can uh, re-tax those shifted profits back uh, home uh, to up to the uh, at least to the level of the minimum taxation so there is a uh, movement on it this cpcr sorry the, the country by country reporting um, is something which is less uh, of important in my view because there is already country by country reporting uh, amongst tax administrations that means the taxmen already know where companies can shift their profits uh, however it is not rendered public uh, and therefore the publication of such data would increase the public pressure on those companies to behave properly. Uh, the second question is on the internet uh, taxation. There is one problem with all these taxes that call out the internet taxes or digital taxes, they are in fact not addressing the benefits or the profits generated they are rather targeting the turnover. That means it is a kind of an additional value added tax, if you so like, and it does not really hit the profits that are shifted somewhere to the US Virgin Islands or so where there is no uh, corporate tax at all. So my main target would be to settle in a minimum tax that is applied globally but not only the tax rate, but also the tax base, because it is also important that you will have an agreement on what is considered to be the taxable income on which then this unified uh, tax rate will be applied. Sorry for being a little bit technical, but uh, I, I, I think that we are now with the new US administration uh, on a good way to make progress in this field. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Ms. Semlek, if you want to add something, you just give me a sign, do you? Okay, fine for Not you. Not right now. <laughs> okay, thanks, okay. So an another question uh, is raised, another topic is raising. Uh, when I look at the map where people will be able to live after four more degrees, it leads me straight away to the hot topic migration policy. Which way should the European Union go in this topic? So, um, who would like to answer first? I, I can have a first. Um, okay, please, Ms. Answer, Hedberg, then yes. I'm happy to uh, leave the rest of the question to my colleagues. I think um, what is happening right now on the borders of Europe is uh, far from how we should act as a European Union. We cannot leave countries who um, are faced with people um, fleeing from their home countries completely alone in the center of Europe, for example, as we are in Austria. And I strongly believe that we need a common, strong and solidary policy for that. Um, may that be of having um, quotas every country need to take on a certain amount of refugees. Mr. Zurich before said we have an overaging population anyways um yeah that's uh, that's just a, a few points on my side okay mr zurek what do you think i mean i know it's a big point but uh, maybe well, a, first as well, of all yeah. i would like to distinguish between migration and refugees because a refugee is somebody who has to leave the place they were because of either military or uh, any natural catastrophe and has no choice if they want to survive. And migration is a process where people try to move to another place where they have more uh, expectations that they can have a decent life. Therefore, these two issues have to be separated in my view, because they are not uh, dealt with at the same level and with the same respect. 
Secondly, I think that for Europe, for the European Union entirely, we do have a very grave demographic problem. We have aging societies and we need to have either more babies, so please get busy all the young people, or uh, to have uh, more people coming, uh, young people in particular, coming to Europe uh, and to work here uh, in all the areas if we want to retain our economic level. And even if we want to have a kind of secure social uh, life, we need also people to take care of the always growing number of people which are dependent on assistance from people coming. And it is absolutely impossible that everybody is relying on Romanian or Slovakian women which are exploited for 24-hour aid to the elderly people and on the other hand they are against foreigners coming to the country and the, the most severe attack I see is that they even dared to reduce the children allowance for those women which are spending their times here. This is an absolutely shabby policy. So I think this is something where we should have a more, um, let's say, considered policy. On the refugee field, there I see that the point is that the present Dublin Convention is not an appropriate uh, instrument to deal with this because I can easily understand that the people living on Lampedusa or in Malta are overwhelmed by the uh, arrival of, 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 of hundreds of thousands of people which have been rescued, if they were rescued at all in the first place, uh, and then uh, simply dumped there, and as well as in Greece, and all the others say, no, no, we don't want to have them. So I think Again, we have to have a considered policy on the way how migration can be organized, as it is done in Canada, as it is done uh, in, in other countries, which are immigration countries, and prepare this. And the other is to not close our eyes for the need of those which are really on the flight and uh, refugees. Okay, thanks to both of you. It was very, very interesting. We have a little bit of time lag in the, in the questions because uh, there's another question for the question we had before, uh, which is, why do you think are countries like Germany and France not much fiercer in working on more corporate tax fairness? They should be profiteers from such a policy. I think that was addressed to you, Mr. Zurek. Should I repeat I, I, the question again? Was it about Germany and France on the tax, on the, on the tax, corporate tax? Yeah, on the corporate tax. Germany and yeah. France, because the, the student says uh, they should be profiteers from such, a, from such a policy. So why are they against? Well, first of all, uh, one has to admit that there is a big difference between, uh, it, uh, according to the size of companies. The bigger the companies are, the more chance they have for this profit shifting and base erosion. Uh, and they do so. And the second is that in the present tax system, there is a built-in uh, heritage from the colonial period. That means uh, revenues are taxed in the country where there is the company's seat and not where the profits are made. That means that Germany's car industry selling their, uh, their, their prime rate cars all over the world are taxed in Germany. Now, the move is at present uh, linked with the question whether shouldn't also those countries where the profits are actually generated also have a right to tax these revenues. And as Germany, as we have seen, has a tremendous uh, surplus in its exports, 
they are afraid that they would perhaps lose out more from sharing the tax base with the countries where they do the exports than getting uh, back a little bit of the profits shifted. Because one has to admit that the big players in profit shifting and tax, and tax ration are those internet-based companies. Uh, because they have intangible product facilities. When you have a, a, a factory, it's easy to locate it and to tax it. But when there is a, a server somewhere in the world, you cannot really get physically hold of it. And therefore it is. So the reason why they are uh, trying to get it done is also because they want to do it in a way without losing out too much in this, in this move. However, they are now for, let's say, I would say five to 10 years determined to bring the tax system uh, in order because they are all afraid of an, uh, a policy that would come if China goes it on its own. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Ms. Hinberger, you are, uh, can you, do you want to add something or is that fine? Because there is another question already. No, that's fine. I just found um, Mr. Zurich's remarks also very interesting. Okay, so, uh, well, as I said, there is a little bit of uh, time lag in the, in the chat. There is a question now again on the refugee and the migration uh, topic and Greece. As to the refugee topic, would you say the EU has failed Greece in providing support and handling the refugee crisis? Greece has long sounded the alarm, but it fell on politician deaf ear. So it's about the refugee uh, point and uh, Greece within the European Union. Who wants to answer this question first? Yeah, I think we also covered that in um, answering the question before regarding migration and refugees. Okay. And I think we, we just strongly urge the European to um, not leave those border countries alone. Okay. If I may only add that, uh, first of all, yes, we failed to leave Greece alone. But you remember that in 2015, when the first wave of refugees came, it was in April 2015 when I had a chat with the Director General of ECHO, which is the one entity in the European Commission that takes care of uh, catastrophes and help uh, aid. So this is the one that is really looking for some kind of catastrophes. They, we were financing uh, camps for refugees from Syria, in Turkey, because there were millions of Syrians uh, leaving Syria because of the civil war, and they were all going to Turkey, and then were taken care of in camps. And in April 2015, the Director General of ECO came to me and said, I'm desperate, I have spent all my annual budget on food aid for the refugee camps already now and i'm afraid that they will make their way to europe if we can't feed them there anymore and what happened in summer 2015 when the aid from the european union to support these camps stopped people went on and walked to Europe. This was the real source of this uh, big movement in 2015. It was a self-inflicted idiocy. Mm. Thanks for that explanation. That's very important on that, uh, on that point. Um, here comes another topic. Uh, really, the students are using the opportunity to ask the questions that are, that are current and uh, interesting for them. A completely other question comes from a student on Germany. Germany now has an increasing problem in right-wing extremism. Would you say 
it would be the same here in Austria. So it, the topic is increasing problem in right-wing extremism. Who would like to start uh, with answering this question? Mr. Zurek, do, would you like to start? Well, I think it is not really comparable because there is one thing that does not really exist in Austria in comparison to Germany, that is two lost generations uh, that were in Eastern Germany and which were uh, are feeling being entirely left behind, whether this is right or not, and which are then uh, really uh, targeted by these right-wing uh, parties. And that's the reason why this uh, famous AfD is so successful in the former GDR, because they have a lot of frustrated people. So uh, in, in, I, I would say that the risk uh, in Austria is, is smaller than it is in Germany, but it is important enough to be scared. Okay, thanks for that. Would you like to add something, Ms. Heenberger? No. What is your impression? On comparing Germany and Austria in that regard? Well, I think um, what they might have in common is um, increased disinformation via a lot of social networks. Um, but I think not only Germany and Austria have that in common, but mm -hmm. the whole world. We, we face that problem globally. Yes, I would agree on that. That's a global, a global topic. It's not just an Austrian and, and German effect. These uh, uh, fake news and, uh, yeah, the echo chambers in the social networks. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. that's another point. Okay, I just have a look at the chat. There is no question rising right now, but uh, maybe before we come, we use the short time, the break, before we come to the next question, let me draw your attention to another point. When we talk about just a more general one, when we talk about the future of the European Union, we are not doing it alone at the moment. On this year's Europe Day on the 9th of May, the European institutions started with the Conference on the Future of Europe. This offers the opportunity to speak up, to say what kind of Europe we want to live, live in and to help shape our future. You will now see the link where you can access to the platform. There is a link uh, from the Conference on the Future of Europe um, as well as uh, the Bürgerinnen Forum, that's another possibility in Austria, uh, the so called Bürgerinnen Forum. We are a non partition platform of EU experts. Does it work again? Can you hear me? Can you hear me out there? Is it working again? Yes. Can you hear me? Also the technical, the colleagues from the Technic? Yep. Does it work again? Sorry for that. That was a technical problem. Um, my colleagues from the Technic just uh, gave me a sign. So I have not sure what you heard. Um, I just start again with uh, the Austrian Bürgerinnen Forum. I started with the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, but again, there is another platform in Austria, the so-called Bürgerinnen Forum. We are a non-partition partition platform of EU experts dedicated to citizen dialogue, exactly that what we are doing 
uh, right now and even more uh, on a more uh, event basis also. I'm glad to be part of this platform. The link is shown on our slide as well. So it's uh, the Bürgerinnen Forum and Conference of the Future of Europe. Please get in contact with us, post your ideas on the Conference of Europe platform so, uh, and get in contact with us. Meanwhile, maybe there are some questions. So coming back to our discussions, are there further questions raised? As far as I can see, it's not the case. And uh, with a look on, the, on our times, on our scheduling, it's Friday afternoon. Maybe that's the reason why. And it was a very, uh, very interesting discussion. So I uh, just have a short uh, short question round to my guests. Do you have a question? Would you like to add something before we uh, come to the end of our uh, online event? Would you like to add something? Yes, absolutely. Um, since uh, Ms. Simlak and me are not that um, different of age, I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious, um, how do you see the European Union in future and what do you uh, actually wish for? Well, as all, can you hear me? Yeah. It's already mentioned in the beginning of the forum today. So I see the future bright right now. <laughs> Not always, but I believe in the European Union, of course. And I think that um, especially our generation knows that we all together are stronger and um, are also stronger on the international market. So as I learned during my exchange semester in Canada, um, it's really an interesting international market also for uh, the other side of the world. And yeah, I wish that we can live in the future in a peaceful and equal and um, yeah, in an equal um, country where everyone can feel safe and have their rights in a democratic world. To say it in a nutshell. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Zembliak. Uh, the other two, would you like to add some kind of uh, uh, final remarks on the event? If I may, I would just invite all participants to become active on the platform and to try to give their opinion on what they consider to be a priority and what they consider to be done and also important what they consider not to be done uh, at, at, at the European level. And uh, I, I, I think it is an exercise worthwhile of being pursued and uh, if you only wait what is done by other people you will perhaps not find that the right things is done that but when you are not participating you lose the right of complaining <laughs> thanks for that very important and i fully agree with that miss hinberger would you also uh, have some final remarks um, yeah, basically what I said uh, in my statement before, I think we need to see where our problems lie and those are continuing um, poverty in the midst of the EU, continuing income imbalances also triggering a lot of social exclusion. And I strongly believe that we as a European country and we as a European Union can um, overcome those uh, inequalities by also focusing on a really sustainable transformation of our lives and economies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, the three of you. It was an amazing afternoon and we had the opportunity to hear from experts from different fields. It was really great. 
We are glad uh, that we could share the insights with you, with our speaker, Anna Heenberger, as well as with the two interview partners, Heinz Zurich, thank you very much, and Nicole Semliak, thanks as well. It was a pleasure having you at today's event. At this stage, I'd like to thank also my colleagues from the University of Applied Sciences Burgenland. First of all, my colleagues who are here with me and the media center, especially the colleagues from the technical um, department, Alexander Schöller, Christian Briedl and Michael Weiss. Also, many thanks to Sarah Reinbrecht, who managed the chat room. For the preparation support, I'd like to thank my colleagues from the department, from the business department, Josefine Kuhlmann and Hannes Breit. I say goodbye at this point, and uh, I really would like to kind of joke, but I find it really, really funny to repeat the sentence uh, said by Mr. Zurich, get busy, all the young people, because we have a problem with aging society in Europe. So uh, for the weekend, what could be, uh, what be, could be nicest? I'm very uh, glad and very honored to have been the, the presenter of uh, this year's European Business Forum Burgenland. Many thanks, of all, many thanks to all of you, to your attention, to your participation in the discussion. And I'm looking forward to next year's European Business Forum. Now, I come really to the very last program point of today, which is the EU anthem. I wish you all the best and stay healthy.